All right, awesome. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity uh, to talk a little bit about my journey into general surgery. It's been, um, you know, quite a long journey, but um, I'm just now at the point where I'm starting residency. So I'm very much excited to share a little bit of knowledge that I've learned along the way and, um, and hopefully offer a little bit of advice um, in terms of the experiences that I've had. So I thought I'd uh, kind of start with talking a little bit about my childhood. Um, I was born and raised, as you kind of mentioned, in the Los Angeles area. I'm actually one of nine children um, on my father's side. Um, I have seven sisters and one brother. And I come from like a very mixed background. Um, my father was born and raised in the South, um, grew up in the Kentucky, in Kentucky, and uh, my mother actually grew up in the Los Angeles area. And, you know, growing up, my parents were small business owners. Um, they both owned dog grooming shops, actually. Um, and then later on, a martial arts shop, which is uh, kind of where I, I developed my love of martial arts and went on to get my second degree black belt in Taekwondo. But um, as a kid, I grew up, you know, working in their businesses pretty much um, throughout and for most of my life, um, I was, you know, for the most part, raised in a single parent household um, with my mom. And um, my father actually passed away when I was 15 years old. And he had a he had a heart attack when I was 15. And I think that that was probably the first um, time that I thought about doing a career in health, actually, um, because he had had, you know, he had hypertensive, he had coronary artery disease, and he died so suddenly that I, I kind of always questioned why he was so adamantly against um, going to the doctor when I was uh, little. And so I think in reflection now, that was probably the first time that I thought about um, going into medicine, um, because I, I didn't really understand why, um, why him and so many of my other siblings actually still refuse to go to the doctor and to seek care. Um, but as I, you know, got closer and closer to applying for um, undergrad, um, what my parents did instill in me was, uh, was basically an incredibly strong work ethic. And neither of them went to college. Um, my father had about, he had an 11th grade education and my mother, graduated from high school. And um, even though they, they didn't have formal educations, they very much instilled in me an incredibly strong work ethic and um, a belief that I could do anything that I wanted to do. And so um, I applied to college. I didn't necessarily know what I was doing um, and applied mostly to state schools. But one of my reach schools was UC Davis. And um, I actually ended up applying there because my mother uh, had always talked about how in another life she would have been a veterinarian. And we knew that she knew that Davis was one of the, the best veterinary schools in the country. And so I just applied to Davis and I was lucky enough to, um, to get into Davis. And, and actually as a, as I was preparing to go to Davis, I, I got a, um, I got an email that offered um, the opportunity to apply into a program that was specific for minority students and that would give students the opportunity to get involved. These were pre-med pre -med students that wanted to get into the sciences and either pursue a PhD in the sciences or um, pursue medicine. And so I ended up getting accepted to a program that I think still remains today. It's called the Biological Undergraduate Scholars Program. And it was specifically for underrepresented minorities and um, giving opportunities to really excel in the sciences. So I actually started at Davis early summer, about three months early, and started taking pre-science classes, pre-biology, pre-chemistry, in order to prepare for the classes that would come in the fall um, and give myself a better chance of, of doing well in those classes. Um, I definitely struggled throughout, you know, throughout my time at Davis. Um, but 
as I was taking sort of some of my general ed classes, I took an art history class and really loved it. Um, my mom had been an artist growing up, so I kind of had an appreciation for art, but um, uh, I found that art history was something that I was, it, 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 that I didn't have to give as much effort as, um, as I, you know, was giving towards my science classes. And it, and it ended up being a really nice pair with all of my upper division, um, really challenging science courses. Um, and during my third year, I actually decided that um, I would double major in art history. And so I ended up spending five years at Davis and I, I, I got my BS in biology. And then I also pursued, pursued my BA in art history. During that time, um, I had a number of different clinical experiences. I mentioned just a couple here, um, um, some that I think were some of the most meaningful in terms of making me think more about medicine as a potential career. Um, the first being SHIP, a community clinic, which was is one of the free health clinics within the Sacramento area that caters to South Asian and Middle Eastern populations. And it was a completely student run clinic. And that was kind of where I, I got my first experience in patient care and seeing patients in the clinic and helping facilitate care um, um, for patients. And that was uh, every weekend I did that. And then um, the program that Jubin started, which was the pre-surgical internship, um, was probably my first experience, you know, that was my first experience in surgery. Um, and that was an incredible opportunity because it allowed me to have this experience of going on these shifts for seven hours and being able to see um, all of the different specialties within surgery, as well as get an idea of what it was like um, to be a surgeon through the Saturday workshops that we had. And I stayed, I stayed um, within that program as an administrative fellow afterwards um, and, and ended up doing about three years within the pre-surgical internship. So at that point, I was excited about surgery. Um, I like the idea of being able to use your hands. Um, uh, to, to fix problems and to help people get better. Um, and so I think, I think in, in addition to sort of my first introduction, uh, and thinking about medicine after the passing of my father, the pre-surgical internship was where I first thought about surgery. As, um, as I was finishing my um, undergraduate, undergraduate degree at UC Davis, I, you know, I was pretty burnt out after five years, but, um, and so I knew that going immediately into uh, medicine would, was not going to be the right choice for me. Um, I, I definitely also wanted a little bit more life experience and I wanted to see what, what other types of healthcare systems there were out in the world. And so kind of on a whim towards the end of my undergrad at Davis, I applied to Peace Corps um, and I went through the interview process. And then about six months after I graduated and I kind of moved home and started working again, um, I got a letter um, inviting me to become a health um, outreach and education volunteer in Namibia. And at the time, um, Peace Corps, at the time in Peace Corps, you couldn't pick where you wanted to go. You could pick a continent, um, but you couldn't pick the country that you wanted to, um, uh, to live in. And um, I think that that way of doing it was actually awesome because you really went where the need was. I think nowadays you can actually pick what country you want to go to. I know, I know it's kind of been halted um, with COVID a bit, but now there's way more options in terms of like where you want, where you can go and um, what type of volunteer you get to be. But, but I was selected to be an HIV AIDS health outreach and education volunteer. It was a, a it ended up being about a two and a half year commitment. Um, and, and, Namib and, you know, Namibia, I, I knew nothing about when I got, when I got that letter. Um, I had to actually look it up on a map. Um, but we all, me and me alongside, I would say 20 other people um, flew into the capital where we did three months of pre-service training and it was training in language um, 
and in capacity building and um, community needs assessments and kind of giving us all the tools that we would need as you know before we went off to our training sites and so i spent three months in the capital and then um, got my assignment which was to work at tindoral health center in a very rural region of the Kavango West in northern Namibia. I kind of put a star on the map as to where that is. It's right along um, the Angolan border. Um, and Tindoro Health Center itself was um, uh, run um, by a, a priest, and it was um, on a Catholic mission, actually. And so when they picked me up um, to start my assignment, I was picked up by, I think it was a, a total of 10 nuns and a priest. And I had never, you know, I, myself, I grew up Jewish. And so it was a huge um, life-changing experience for me to kind of go up to this brand new place and, um, and be immersed in a completely new culture and to learn the language. And so I, I moved there. I didn't have access to, um, uh, to cell phone service or internet for the two years that I was there. And, but I was able to really kind of get to know my community. It was a very small community, a very rural community. And I lived actually within the health center. And while I was there, I participated in a number of different projects. I um, added some pictures for you guys to see, but um, it was called St. Lawrence Sindoral Health Center. And uh, that is a little bit of what the, the health center looked at looked like. But my job was to do patient and youth education. So um, to talk about HIV AIDS up in the north, HIV is about one in four. Um, so it was a huge epidemic and everybody, you know, every, a lot of people had it, but not a lot of people wanted to talk about it. Um, teenage pregnancy was also a big issue at the time. Um, there were lots of children, or I mean, I would say kids between the ages of 13 to 15, 16. So teenagers who were, you know, that would come to the health center and were pregnant. And so we did a lot of outreach and education for that. And then we saw a ton of malaria um, because we were living right alongside the river. Um, what I loved about Peace Corps was that it gave you a ton of creativity also to kind of figure out what things you wanted to help your community out with or, or let them come to you and talk and have conversations about um, how you could um, improve or things that they wanted to work on within their community. And one of the things that um, a bunch of the community members had come and talked to me about was doing a gardening project. And so I applied for um, a, a PEPFAR grant, which um, was for about $5,000. And I was able to secure that for them in order to do a garden. Um, and I, I think I brought, I think I added a picture of that. Yeah. So I had about 10, 10 um, people that were part of my gardening group. And it was specifically for people living with HIV or AIDS. And we built this large enclosed structure with the money that we got from PEPFAR. Um, and we grew um, fresh fruits and vegetables. And so that, you know, that was huge and significant and being able to participate with them in that and help them build that garden um, was probably one of the most memorable things I was able to kind of accomplish while I was there. Um, and we were able to get seeds donated um, from nonprofit organizations in the US and and get the gardening uh, group going and actually sell fresh fruits and vegetables to people in the community. Um, one of the other things that that I kind of um, also participated in was youth um, exploring and achieving in health, which was a network of clubs that we started while while we were in Namibia and it was about 10 boys and girls clubs that different Peace Corps volunteers did all over Namibia. And we would come together and we would put, put on these workshops and we did a teenage pregnancy workshop. This is kind of the picture from that. And then we also did a yearly um, 
camp for the kids. And that included both the learners and the kids, but also Namibian counterparts. So people that were interested in teaching and education and collaborating with them um, within the community. And uh, that's just a picture of me at the end of my service um, alongside, I think there were 13 of us um, when, we, when we finished um, that successfully completed and people went all over Namibia. So they were kind of stationed all over the country. Was and that then, the ambassador, the, the old white guy in the middle? Yeah, the old white guy is the ambassador. Um, he, was, he, yeah, he was the Peace Corps ambassador for Namibia. And so he did our close of service ceremony um, at the end. And then, you know, in addition to being able to have this really incredible experience and, um, you know, work within the community, I also had amazing opportunities to travel um, throughout my experience in Namibia. And these are just a few pictures from the different places um, that I went over my two and a half years there. Um, we went, the, the one in the top left is um, a kayaking trip that we did on Lake Malawi um, during, I think it was a uh, winter, winter break one year. And so we went kayaking all over Lake Malawi and we stayed on beaches and um, had basically um, were sleeping in tents and we had uh, a guy with us and he's the one in the picture and he would, um, he showed us around, we did snorkeling with him. It was a really awesome experience. And then uh, this picture on the right, that's a picture of um, Victoria Falls in, um, in Zimbabwe. And I did, I actually bungee jumped off of Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe um, towards the end of my service. Uh, this picture here is a, a view of Tate, like from Table Mountain in South Africa, where I went to Cape Town a few times. Um, during uh, during Peace Corps. And then this last picture is actually with my best friend and she's still actually, she's still my best friend today. Um, uh, we went to Ethiopia on our way back to the States after Peace Corps had finished. And we saw Lucy, which is, um, you know, some of the oldest remains on the earth. And so uh, that was a, an amazing experience as well. And so, you know, after two and a half years in the Peace Corps, I was, you know, I was pretty ecstatic because my mom called me um, while I was actually still living in Africa. And she had received a letter from UCLA um, about my admission there. And when she opened it, um, it actually said that I would receive the Geffen Scholarship, which was basically made my four years of um, medical school completely free. And I know that this has become more popular over the years now. A lot more schools are offering this. And I think um, for people applying into medicine, um, looking for these different opportunities and scholarships is really awesome. And I felt so lucky um, to be able to get this scholarship. And, um, and I know that nowadays there's a lot more out there. So I, I flew back and pretty immediately, I want to say three months after flying back from Africa, I started medical school at UCLA. Um, and it was definitely incredibly challenging, um, but it was an amazing experience and I learned so much. Um, I spent the first two years doing basic sciences, um, which is pretty standard for medical school. Um, but I think something that that um, I struggled with within my first two years was, um, and I put it on there, this feeling of imposter syndrome. And I think that it's something that um, many people struggle with actually throughout medical school, but feeling sort of like, you know, like you're almost, you have so much anxiety and feeling like you almost don't deserve to be there. Um, I had I had gotten the scholarship and I was so thankful for that, but I really struggled during my first two years with feeling like I didn't necessarily deserve to be there um, because you're, you know, you're really thrown in with people from all different walks of life. And um, it can be difficult sometimes to, um, to do well in that environment. And I think during my first two years, I definitely struggled. Um, 
after your first two years of basic science research, you do a year of clinical rotations and then, and then you kind of decide what specialty you wanted to go, you want to go into. I had some really amazing experiences in surgery um, and working in specifically county settings. So I did a lot of work at Harbor UCLA, um, which was our county affiliate, and then a little bit of work at all of you as well. And during those rotations, I really fell in love with surgery. I loved being able to use my hands and there was no other place that I wanted to be other than an operating room. Um, and I, and the patient populations were great. And so that had pretty much solidified for me that, that surgery was, was the, the route that I wanted to take. And so during my last year of medical school, I did sub eyes and general surgery, which is basically kind of, uh, auditions, um, where you, um, go to different hospitals and you spend a month and you, you know, you take care of patients and you function as you would, uh, as an intern. And, um, it kind of sets you up for the application process. And then some of the other things I mentioned here, and I guess some of the pictures I'll also explain, um, was that I think what was really unique to UCLA um, were opportunities to get involved with social justice, health advocacy, equity. I was personally very much invested in LGBTQ health as well, um, but I thought UCLA really did a fantastic job at, um, at kind of having avenues to do things in all of these different areas. And um, I remember after the after George Floyd was murdered, we all got together and we, you know, we went out and we protested and that was a picture. Um, and we developed a group that was called White Coats for, for Black Lives Matters. Um, I also did specific stuff that was, uh, I did stuff that was specific to LGBTQI uh, health as the co-president of MedGlo, which is the medical gay lesbian organization. And we put on conferences um, to get people involved and to educate about health issues that were specific to the LGBTQ community. And it ended up being a very collaborative experiences with medical schools all over California. So we had USC, we had San Diego, we had Riverside, and we all got together and put on a conference um, once a year. And then for, for some of you that um, are interested in going into surgery, I think that um, one thing that during medical school, I wanted to make sure I had the opportunity to do was, was do research and research that could address health disparities in surgery. That was that still is something that is incredibly meaningful to me. And so during my, th after my third year of medical school, I decided to take a gap year and get my MPH in, in epidemiology at UCLA. And I did that um, because at the time I was working with a trauma surgeon uh, down at Harbor UCLA, and he had given me the opportunity to do a small project um, looking at pediatric patients um, after firearm injury. And I wanted the ability to be able to conduct research um, on my own and to be able to critically analyze my own research and um, analyze my own results. And so I really felt like an MPH would be a great opportunity for me to more intimately acquaint myself with uh, the, the tools and resources to be able to conduct my own research. And so I ended up actually making um, my thesis project, um, this project that I was working, working on down at Harbor UCLA. Um, but, and it, and it eventually got published. Um, firearm injuries um, within the trauma surgery world are still continue to kind of be a hot topic. Um, and I think in addition to being a trauma surgeon, being able to go in and kind of operatively address traumas as they come in, um, there's been a huge shift within the last 10 years to do, to do more afterwards. So after you fix somebody um, who comes in with a, a gunshot wound or a stab wound from a surgical standpoint, what are the other things that we're kind of missing? And so, you know, these people have um, tend to be, um, uh, minorities, black and brown people, they're most affected by um, gunshot wounds still in the U.S. today. And so 
what are the things that we can sort of do to mitigate the disparities and hospital-based violence intervention programs have become um, um, something that a lot more community hospitals and hospitals in general are doing um, to try to create avenues and resources for people affected by firearm, injur firearm injuries um, to be able to utilize after the fact. So after you've been shot, um, and maybe you're involved in gang, gang or gun violence, and, and that is um, sort of been a lifestyle. Are there things that we can do and interventions that we can do within a hospital setting that would allow people to have access to resources that, that they could use to possibly change their life? And so um, this is something I'm still very passionate about and something that I've continued um, to do even, even now um, as an intern at UCSF. Um, I definitely had setbacks along the way. Um, I think at the end of medical school, I knew that I wanted to be a general surgeon. Um, I had had good mentorship, but I, I definitely didn't have many people that, uh, that many mentors that I found, I guess, throughout uh, medical school. Um, it was definitely hard for me to find good mentorship. And so when I applied into general surgery um, in 2021, I think I, I felt in some ways kind of lost. Um, I had some people that I was able to talk, you know, talk to who gave me advice and helped me along the way, but I didn't really have that person. And I think for anybody at the end of medical, you know, towards the middle to end of medical school, the most important thing that you can do is find mentors or people um, that are in positions that you see yourself in one day. And I, and I don't think that I had that necessarily at UCLA, um, but I, I, you know, I was gung ho about surgery. I applied to over a hundred programs. Um, my step scores, which um, is an exam that you take after your second and then last year of medical school, um, they weren't great. They weren't strong scores. The average score for people getting into general surgery is about 230. Um, my scores were a little bit lower than that. I scored 214 on step one and 216 on step two. I had over five letters of recommendation. So I was able to, to get good letters of recommendation. And at the time I also had um, a ton of different publications as well. So I had over 10 publications. Um, and despite that, I, I really only got four interviews for, for residency um, the first time around, um, one of which was a prelim surgery interview. So five, I guess, in total, but um, one of which was a prelim surgery interview um, that one of my mentors, I guess, had connected me with that was in rural, um, I think it was in rural Illinois is the Carl Foundation. But um, at the end of, you know, at the end of medical school, I actually didn't match into general surgery. Um, and I think when I reflect back on the reasoning for not matching into general surgery, I think it comes down to not maybe um, having the mentorship that I needed, and then also just not having the scores. I think that things are kind of starting to change. But um, scores when I applied were huge. And, and if you didn't have the scores, um, it made it really difficult um, to even get your foot in the door and to even just interview. So despite, you know, I was pretty devastated after not um, matching into general surgery. Um, there's, a, there's a supplemental application process that happens after you don't match that's called the SOAP. And um, basically it looks, it give it shows you all of the leftover, um, positions in the country. And then there are programs that are looking for preliminary general surgery residents. And so I applied to the SOAP and got a call for actually from UCSF offering me a prelim general surgery position. And basically what that meant was that I would have another, I would have my first year, um, of a residency sort of uh, the way I like to think about it, kind of auditioning again um, and helping better prepare me to reapply so that I could be considered for what we call a categorical general surgery position, which is um, 
a, a six to seven year track. And so for the last year, I, I have been a prelim um, at UCSF and it's actually been a really amazing experience. I think um, and thinking back about it now, um, with every, you know, with every perceived failure, I think that um, there comes an opportunity. And my opportunity was, you know, to do a prelim at UCSF and to kind of showcase that I had the ability um, to make it as a surgeon. And so for the last year, I've been doing 80 hour plus weeks um, of direct patient care. You have opportunities to rotate through all the different specialties within surgery, from general surgery to trauma. I've done neurosurgery, um, liver and kidney transplant, um, as well as surgical oncology and cardiothoracic surgery. And um, I, you know, most of the time as an intern, your your job is to take care of the floor patients to get really good at um, at patient care and, and you don't get as much time in the operating room, but, um, you do get, you know, unique opportunities here and there to get into the operating room. Um, we, we have weekly didactics and surgical skills training. Um, you're expected to do the ab site, which is another exam, um, that you do yearly, um, basically throughout residency. I continued to participate in trauma surgery research. Um, this time I, I chose to participate in research at UCSF East Bay, um, which is a, a, a community-based university affiliated program um, that is in the Oakland area. And so I, I was able to find mentorship there um, and get myself in, involved in research. And that has been really awesome. And I think the difference um, and going through my prelim year is that I've really had solid mentorship. Um, I knew that scores were an issue for me and, and I needed to do well on my ab site. And I had the mentorship at UCSF and people that were behind me that helped me and um, offered, you know, offered people and PhDs that could help me with my test taking anxiety and, um, sort of address the areas where I had fallen short the year prior. And so I actually reapplied to residency just this past year. I, I again applied to over a hundred programs. And this time, instead of getting, you know, four interviews, I got 13 interviews, um, which was huge and very exciting. And um, I'll save this till the end. And so um, as of March, I actually um, matched into a categorical surgery position at UCSF East Bay. And so I'm very much excited um, to, to be able to pursue um, my dream of becoming a surgeon and, and having that really become a reality. And I think that um, UCSF has been great and kind of set, set me up for success um, in being able to secure the position that I wanted. I thought um, for for those of you that are interested, oh, where did I go? That those of you that are interested in kind of just having a, a general overview of what general surgery residency is like, um, and you know, kind of what I'll be doing now for the next uh, seven years. But typically, general surgery residency programs can span anywhere from five to seven years, um, depending on what type of um, of program you decide. There, there are academic programs. There are programs um, like UCSF East Bay, which is a community-based university affiliated programs program. And then there's um, there's community programs as well. Um, most of the community programs are about five years. The academic programs are seven years because they often require you to do a mandatory two years of research. And then um, some of the community-based university affiliated can be about six years, which is what UCSF East Bay is. Um, so I'll do a year of research um, after my third year as um, uh, my first, my PGY3 year, basically. I'll continue doing weekly didactics and surgical skills training. And that's something that you um, that you do throughout. And you're able to learn advanced laparoscopic techniques as well as robotics. Um, I'll continue doing the yearly in-service training exam. Exams never really go away um, throughout general surgery residency. They, um, they continue. And so you, you will have um, 
at least a five hour exam every year, probably, you know, throughout, throughout. Um, and then in terms of specialties, there's a ton of different pathways from general surgery, which is why I love general surgery, because there's just so many different ways that you can go. There's cardiothoracic, there's pediatric surgery, there's trauma, there's burns, there's transplant, um, MIS and bariatrics, breast, endocrine, plastics, and then surgical oncology and hepatobiliary. Um, and depending on whatever you decide that you want to specialize in, um, you, you'll do a more, more or less research um, for, for specialties that tend to be more competitive, um, such as pediatrics or surgical oncology. It's generally recommended that you do two years of research. And then and then once again, you'll you'll apply for fellowship at the end of um, of your general surgery training, and the fellowships can be anywhere from one to three years, and um, and you'll do written and oral boards at the end of them in order to actually become a full fledged general surgeon. And so, I, I guess some of the things that I was thinking about when. Um, in creating, you know, this presentation for you guys or, or as pre-med students, or maybe you're in medical school now thinking about residency, but some of the takeaways that I had, I think throughout my journey, you know, from undergrad all the way to where I am now, I think that um, I've always been someone who has followed my interests and passions. And I think, especially as a pre-med student, this is probably like um, the thing that will set you apart um, outside of just your basic science courses and doing really well. So I think following your interests and your passions, for me, it was art history and I, and I, um, and then, you know, doing Peace Corps. And, and I think that that definitely made me more competitive when I applied, um, to medical school later on. And so I would just encourage all of you to kind of follow your passions and then use that to, um, to kind of, uh, support your interest in medicine and to showcase that. Um, I also think that mentorship is huge. I kind of wish that I would have, um, during medical school found mentors that, that believed in me, um, and were willing to support me, um, and my path um, to becoming a surgeon. I think that I found that later on when I went to UCSF, but I don't think that I necessarily had that right, um, right from the beginning. And then um, persisting through perceived failures. I think, you know, despite being devastated that I um, didn't match the first time that I applied to general surgery, um, going to UCSF and doing a prelim in general surgery taught me a lot about persisting and um, continuing and, and being resilient um, and trying again. I think that um, you may not get exactly what you want the first time, but I think um, being persistent is key, um, specific, especially in surgery. And then I think, you know, surgery needs more underrepresented minorities. And, and I think things are finally really beginning to change. Um, for the, you know, I think for so long, um, it's been heavily focused on your scores um, that kind of determines what kind of doctor you get to be in some instances. Um, and especially for surgery, um, they used to kind of screen you out immediately if you didn't have the score. And I think things are finally starting to change. Um, they're making board exams now pass, no pass. And they're starting to do more of a holistic review process, which I think um, will be huge for people applying into general surgery later on. And so thank you. Um, I hope I've kind of given you guys a little bit of a glimpse um, into my path and I can take any questions. I have a question. Um, during your undergrad um, years, what uh, what were some of the experiences that you really felt solidified or uh, made the decision that you were going to pursue this path? Honestly, I think it. I think for me, it was um, it was SIP. Um, I 
that was probably the, you know, one of, it was such a challenging experience, but it was um, so rewarding. And I loved being able to go on and do seven hour shifts in the hospital and see all the different um, subspecialties within, within surgery and just being able to shadow. Um, I felt like it really gave me a glimpse into what surgery looked like. And I enjoyed the times where I was just standing and observing for seven hours in the OR. Um, and then I think the, the workshops that we had on Saturdays, um, which people from different surgical subspecialties would come and kind of share their experiences and their stories in surgery, um, was, uh, was like, I, I thought that, you know, that was something that I wanted to do and I could envision myself doing it. And so honestly, I think SIP is what, um, what was hugely influential, um, in first getting me interested in surgery. One of the questions, what study techniques work best for you in medical school? In medical school? Um, I think that in medical school, you'll find that the information that you're expected to sort of digest weekly is huge. And um, I think what really worked for me is oftentimes, you know, you'll have five lectures a day. Um, and I would do a first pass of all five lectures, um, pretty much throughout the day. And then I would do one more pass before I went to bed. And if I didn't do that, I found that, um, it was really difficult to keep up. And so I think that, you know, day to day, really staying on top of all the lectures that we had and reviewing and re-reviewing, especially because for me, I wasn't the kind of person that necessarily got it the first time I saw it. I was uh, the person that needed to do multiple passes to really digest the material. And so I think while, you know, staying on top of that and staying on top of the lectures and not getting behind um, was what I did to to really stay on top of it in medical school. Um, I also did a lot of group stuff. So um, I found friends and we would do, you know, Saturday group sessions where we would do teach back stuff and we would sit and we would teach each other in the material to make sure that we understood it. How um, did you have a uh, time for a hobby in medical school? I did. Um, probably not as much as I would have liked, but, um, I guess one of my hobbies is still kind of going to art museums and I was pretty close to the Getty in, uh, at UCLA. And so I would do that a bunch. Um, I did hiking as well. Um, I, I wish that I probably would have done more, um, hobbies. And I think it's easy to kind of get bogged down by, um, all of the work that you have to do and the studying, but I think it's important to take time for that. And it's something I probably wished I would have done more of. How did you handle or manage your imposter syndrome? Um, you know, I think that in the beginning, it, it can be a pretty isolating experience. And um, after a while, um, I started to kind of be more open about it with my friends and, and I felt, and then I learned that a lot of them were experiencing the same thing and it wasn't just something that was unique to me. And so, um, sort of creating, I guess, an open forum with my friend group at the time, um, and, uh, and being able to kind of discuss that I think helped. And then I was lucky enough to have my family close by, um, they were only about 30 minutes from me. And so I went home often and I had support in that way. Um, is the app side required for other specialties or only in surgery? So the app site is specific um, to surgery, but um, there are other surgery, there are, there are other surgery, surgical programs. Like if you choose to do an integrated surgery program, they do have 
Um, they do have integrated pathways. So for people that are interested in going into plastic surgery or CT surgery, they offer straight paths now for that. And they take their own board exam as well. Um, that's a little bit different and specific already to their specialty of interest, if that makes sense. Um, the absite is unique to, to surgery, um, but there are board exams that you're required to take for any specialty within medicine. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that they, they are also yearly. Yeah. So the moral of the story is you will be taking exams for the rest of, well, until you're done with residency and then you pass your board and then you do it every 10 years. So yeah, you're going to be taking tests. And, and I think the best um, advice I ever heard was make sure you uh, learn how to become a good test taker, because that is like one of the things that a lot of um, that you're graded on, but also many of these organizations, that's how they make their money is by giving tests. So you, yeah, there are definitely a ton of tests um, that you take throughout medical school and they're all very expensive, um, but you're required to pass all of them in order to even just be able to move on to residency. What's the most interesting surgery you've been part of or seen? Hmm. It's a good question. trying to think I think um I think probably um this year I saw a ton of whipples on surgical oncology and that is um probably one of my favorite surgeries to watch um it takes about six anywhere from six to eight hours to do um typically for people that have pancreatic cancer. Um, and so I would say that is probably one of my favorite surgeries to, to watch and to be a part of it. Um, when you reapply for residency, do you take, do you retake step one and step two? No. no step three. <laughs> so, um, you, you don't. So the thing about step one and step two is that after you take those tests, that's it. Um, unless you fail, um, those scores are, you know, a little bit different than medical school where like you can retake the MCAT and improve your score. Um, the step scores, once you pass it, that score is your score. Um, and there's no way for you to improve it. It just kind of is what it is. Um, step three, you'll take during your intern year. Um, are residency interviews long and what kind of questions did they ask you? Ah, um, you know, now that everything is virtual, it's a, it's, it's different, I think, than it used to be. It used to be that you would go to all of the schools and you actually had to pay um, to fly to all the different schools the same way that you did for medical school. Um, and you would interview for a full day. Um, but now they do Zoom interviews. They're typically half a day and you'll interview with um, sometimes a panel of people and sometimes um, you'll have different faculty interviews. Typically you'll have like anywhere from like three, I want to say to six um, faculty interviews. And they're pretty quick, anywhere from like 15 to 20 minutes. And then you may have um, another interview with a chief resident as well. Um, what, uh, what things that you did in undergraduate that you enjoyed um, and actually helped you with your mental health and your sanity? During undergrad? Um, I think um, during undergrad, the art, um, the art stuff was kind of how I maintained my sanity. And so I, even though there were classes, I was doing 
uh, ceramic sculpture classes. I was also doing like studio art classes for that degree. And that tended to be really calming. And I, and I did other things like I, um, uh, 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 did an internship in an art gallery, um, which were just so different from studying for biochemistry or physics that I think that kind of helped me maintain my sanity. And then just, you know, spending time with friends as well. Um, this is a question from someone. Someone told me that after the MCAT start studying for step one, because the scores are very important. Uh... So I, if, if you would have um, asked me that, um, you know, when I, when I was doing medical school, I would say that like step one um, was arguably kind of the, the most important test that you take during medical school. That has changed though. And um, step one is now pass, no pass. And so I think that that's huge um, because now all you have to do is pass. And so I don't think that you need to, to start studying, um, you know, after your MCAT for that. I think that you'll have dedicated study time um, during medical school and after you've kind of accumulated enough knowledge um, uh, getting through your medical school classes that you'll you'll have time for that. And I don't think that, yeah, I don't think that you need to, to start studying that early. Yeah. And also step one is mostly things that you learn your first two years of medical school. So it is really, really hard. Certainly some of the case presentations, differential diagnosis, you only learn those in medical school. So I don't think it's a, something that you really can do. I would say after the MCAT, start working on your AMCAS application. Um, Definitely. Your essays, your secondaries. I think that's a better spend time than worrying about step one, which you don't have access to that content. Um, this is a funny question, but um, how many hours are you on your feet during residency? Uh, infinite hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, um, some shifts, you know, if I'm charting or doing that kind of stuff, I'll have opportunities to kind of sit or grab lunch, but there are some, you know, some shifts where you're, you're on your feet for like 12 hours, 12 to 14 hours. Also explain to them that the hours that you are on, it doesn't mean that you're standing the whole time. You have ability to do other things. Yeah. I mean, as, a, as an intern, um, you're directly involved in patient care. And so you're caring for oftentimes post-op patients. So people that have had surgery and are now recovering in the hospital. And so you're writing their progress notes. Um, you're checking their labs. You're interpreting their labs and you're managing their care. Um, and going to see them and making sure that they're doing well, in addition to being able to go to the OR for other surgeries that are happening. You're not spending, um, actually the majority of your time is not spent in the OR um, during your first year of residency. No, but also uh, talk about like, it's not like a job working at a supermarket that you're standing, you're, so you have ability to sleep, you have yeah. ability to read. So you're not like, uh, you're not like it's, I think a lot of people that are not in medicine, they feel like, you know, if you have to work 36 hours, you're, no, a lot of people sleep, the more senior you get, actually, the more free time that you have. Uh, I think there's like a meme that I've seen, video meme that, you know, it's a it's a lounge, and then the chief resident is texting and doing Wordle, while the intern is charting on the computer. And so mm -hmm. that's kind of like, the more you go up, uh, and you know, in some of the more senior positions too, they take call from home. So, yeah, I definitely would say that, you know, as you go up, you have less responsibility in terms of like charting. Um, and you have more ability to, to sleep and, um, get a little bit more rest. Um, but I think, 
with that also comes more responsibility um, because the levels of care are all um, very hierarchical. So even though I'm the intern and I'm managing care, um, I have a senior that I report to that I ask if I can, you know, do different things. And they're the ones who will say yes or no, and they may, you know, touch base with the attending. And so there are all these different hierarchies within surgery and medicine, um, um, where you're escalating and you're asking if it's okay to do different things. So do you say that it would be right that if you don't do well in hierarchical organizations, you will have some challenges? I think so. Because I think that um, seniority in medicine is very much respected. And so as an intern, if my chief tells me to do something, I mean, unless you think it's, you know, you can always voice your opinion, you have freedom to do that. But I think that um, you respect um, the people that are senior to you. And, um, and that's just kind of how it works. And it's the same at the attending level, Um, what they they're the ones that are making the ultimate decisions about patient care. Um, And they, you know, what they say often goes and you and you respect that and you respect them for their knowledge. Um, another question, um, in your residency, what do you do to decompress and have, you know, sanity? And, say, and have sanity? Um, you know, I think it's even more challenging during residency um, to find ways to decompress, but um, I... I've started doing things like a little bit of meditation when I get home. Um, I've also continued doing the art stuff that I love. So sometimes on the weekends, if I have a day off, um, I'll go to Golden Gate Park and I'll go to the De Young Museum and I'll look at art for a little while or just sit in the park. And I find that that's a way for me to decompress. I also really like, you know, like I'm a bit of a foodie. So going to different restaurants or enjoying um, different foods on my days off. That's another way I kind of am able to decompress from the stress. Does anybody have any other questions? Um, you had one slide that you said you were going to come back to. Oh, and I didn't. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it. Um, the other question I have is um, in medical school, um, I mean, during the mo- medical school interview process, what some of the, if you would do it again, what would you do and why? In you application. Mean, in, oh, in terms of my application to medical school? Yeah, that, that how would you do in the whole process? How would you do it differently or would you do it exactly the same? I think that um, in terms of studying for my MCAT, I would have done that differently. I ended up taking my MCAT in South Africa. um, And I did that because I was in the Peace Corps and um, I didn't really have many other options. And I ended up applying actually from Africa, um, which was super stressful. And I wouldn't recommend trying to apply to medical school from outside the country, but um, I think in terms of studying for the MCAT, um, I would have done that a little bit differently, but I thought in terms of my application, um, I was able to put together something that was pretty unique. At least um, I tried to make it so that nothing on my application was something that you read twice, if that makes sense. So, in my personal statement, I talked about Namibia and I, and my whole personal statement was actually about um, the experience that I had had in Namibia. And so all the other things that I had done in terms of research, in terms of the surgical internship program, in terms of shift a community clinic, those were all new things and activities on my application. So nothing was repeated in my application. And I think uh, I would do that the same.
Um, did you find the slide? I think it's right there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, this was something that I was going to share with you guys um, that I wrote this. So when I was writing my personal statement, um, for my reapplication to residency. Um, this was one of, you know, the paragraphs that I wrote where I talked about not matching into residency. And um, basically during, after I didn't match into residency, my mother said something really, um, pro that ended up being pretty profound. And she said something like, Rachel, you can either let this failure define you or you can be defined by how you choose to respond and what you do next. Um, and then the rest of that paragraph kind of reads, I let my her words sear through me, but quickly dusted off my shame and feelings of inadequacy and reflected upon how I could channel my disappointment into drive. As a current prelim surgical intern at UCSF, I have immersed myself in patient care while rotating through different surgical specialties, refined my study skills to address my weakness in standardized testing, and honed my surgical skills and knowledge and knowledge base. I have redis rediscovered that I am resilient, passionate, and in the face of failure, will always choose to be defined by what I do next. Um, I included that because I think that, you know, whether it's applying to medical school or applying to residency, you may have instances where things really just don't go your way and you have to deal with that disappointment you have to reflect you have to kind of go back to the drawing board and figure out how and what you're going to do better and then be able to talk about it um, and come from a place of strength and so um i shared i share that because i think that um resilience is huge um in in even just pursuing medicine in general and, um, and this was kind of how I turned it around for myself when I was struggling and, and having to face not, not matching. So. Other question is a lot of times when you're in the room, um, from undergrad to medical school to even residency, many times you're probably the only black woman in the room. Um, how do you handle that and how do you uh... yeah you know I think um, it's something that you are aware of constantly um, I don't think that you I think you know you kind of get used to it over time um, but it's always something that you're hyper aware of um, they're really isn't much diversity in surgery. And so I think oftentimes you may be the only person of color in your program or um, in the room with other people. And it can be difficult. Um, but I guess I haven't, you know, I haven't, I've tried to not really let it bother me. I think um, being strong and just knowing that you're supposed to be there, um, just like everybody else is what I continue to tell myself. Um, even though there aren't a ton of people, um, that necessarily look like me in surgery. So. Um, all righty. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? Because, uh, you know, you know, if you don't have any other questions. Oh, I have another question. Um, it's actually was posted in the pre uh, thing. Um, how did you improve uh, your test study, test study skills and standardized testing skills? What, what, what have I do? done? Yeah, I mean, um, when I was, you know, during this past year at, um, at UCSF, um, my, my advisor actually linked me with somebody who specializes in um, test taking and test taking anxiety. Um, for me, a lot of the issues that I had with standardized test taking um, centered around anxiety, just around taking these eight hours, sometimes nine hour tests. And I think 
it's easy to kind of get in your head while you're taking these tests and think like, oh, maybe I'm not doing well. What, what could happen if I fail? And so this year, I think what really helped me was um, meeting with um, that specialist who kind of gave me tangible ways to reduce my anxiety um, during um, a standardized test. Uh, and then I think, you know, just continuing to try to figure out what works for you as you study, um, how you best retain information. I tend to be like more of a visual learner. And so I'll have to draw things out and make sense of it. And so I think um, kind of continuing to think about ways to become more efficient with my studying. Um, how much time I need to spend, like drawing things out to make sure I understand it. That's something that I still continue to work, work on. Um, but I think it helped me this year. If you would do your undergrad over again, what would you do differently and why? Mm. I mean, I think I, I would have applied to more schools for undergrad if I could go back. Um, uh, I, at the time, had a guidance counselor um, in high school who basically said that my chances of getting into college were very low, and she was really awful and, and negative, and it limited the, the number of places I applied to when I applied to undergrad. I didn't apply anywhere out of state. I didn't think that it would even be possible for me to consider like an Ivy League um, education or, and, and, you know, for the most part applied um, to state schools. And then Davis was my like one reach school. And so I think if I could go back and do undergrad again, I would, <laughs> coming out of high school, I would have applied um, to more places and broaden my horizons. Um, and then I think during undergrad, you know, I, I studied really hard during undergrad. So I don't know if I would have changed anything during undergrad. I really tried to make sure that I had a lot of clinical experiences, a lot of research experiences. Um, so I don't know if I would change anything about my actual undergrad experience. What about medical school? Medical school, I wish that I would have um, reached out for help earlier. Um, I think, as I kind of mentioned, struggling with like imposter syndrome, feeling like you don't belong or you're kind of like you don't belong there. Um, I think I would have reached out to people sooner um, because it can be pretty isolating trying to go through it by yourself. And I think I would have also expanded my horizons in terms of mentorship. Um, like I kind of mentioned, I don't think that I, I had um, a ton of really amazing inter uh, mentorship as I was deciding to go into surgery. And so I think I would have done more research in terms of finding people that I identified with and that I thought could be good potential mentors. And then, um, I don't have any other questions that were posted. If anybody doesn't have any other questions, we're gonna let Dr. Brothwell go because she worked last night and she's working again tonight. So she would probably want more sleep. 